Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.thebenjamindixonshow.com to register for our blog and join the Progressive Army. What if I'm if if I'm your son? What advice would you give me the next time I be pulled over by a police officer? Next time be pulled over, pulled over by a police officer. I would do my best to identify who that police officer is in a polite way, ask him or her for their name. I would respect what they are doing so that you don't get shot in the back of the head. But I would also be very mindful of the fact that as a nation, we have got to hold police officers accountable for the actions that they commit. And that is, so to answer your question, I would be very cautious, if you were my son, in terms of dealing with that police officer, but I also defend my rights and know my rights and make sure, if possible, that police officer's camera is on what goes on. Okay, Uh, let's just jump right into this. We'll get to all the pleasantries later. Bernie Sanders was both right and wrong, correct and incorrect, sufficient and insufficient. Let's start with where he was right. Let's just be real. I'm going to be real with you if no one else is. This is literally what I'm going to tell my kids. I mean, as as much as I cover. No, I don't really cover police brutality anymore. I was talking with a friend last night. The reason I don't cover it is because it hurts. It's a deep pain because we black people in particular have all experienced being pulled over. And in that moment, you have to make a decision. Right or wrong, justified or unjustified. In that moment, you have to make a decision that nobody else, well, particularly no white American has to make. Whether or not I'm going to assert myself and to assert the idea that I think, Mr. Officer, you're wrong. Just that. Like, or, or even to question what, why are we being pulled over? I don't cover it because it is a deep, deeply seated pain. Not only because I've had a friend personally killed, a personal friend killed by police officers, and I'm sure that has a lot to do with it. I, I pretty much stopped covering these type of stories after uh, Corey Jones was killed. I, I just couldn't, couldn't really do it. But also because every one of us, black people, people we have memories of these encounters with police officers and there's a clear decision making point where you have to decide in yourself whether or not I'm going to assert my manhood or my womanhood or my personhood which is whether or not I'm going to assert my own human dignity and allow this police officer to continue to treat me the way he's treating me police officers who look they're waiting they're like itching for an opportunity to escalate a situation and you the person who's on the receiving end of this injustice have to double. You have to be doubly insulted like that, like the, the pain is double because not only are you on the receiving end of an injustice from a police officer who's like gone, gone too far or made a mountain out of a molehill like you were going two miles over the speed limit or or you were driving late at night and you got pulled over simply because you're, you know, with no explanation. Right. No explanation. No good, justifiable reason. But if you. Didn't do anything but say, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And, and, and just try to kowtow to their moment of hubris, their moment, their big moment. Like this is their moment to shine and to do what they've been trained to do, which generally includes escalating. I don't care how many times they tell us that they train each other on de-escalation. The proof is in the pudding. But in that moment that we are on the receiving end of an injustice, we have to it, it's compounded doubly. Because we also have to sacrifice our dignity and our manhood, our womanhood, our personhood and, and, and our humanity and take down when we know we are the ones who have been wronged. And even even if our perception of the situation is jaded and, and, and misconstrued and maybe we did do something wrong, we don't have the luxury of even exploring that. What we have to do in those moments is simply say yes, sir or no, sir. Keep our hands in plain sight. 
Don't make any sudden movements. And this is literally what Bernie Sanders said is literally what I'm going to tell my kids. But where it's insufficient is that he did not address that underlying pain that most black people have in this country because every single one of us has a story or two or like me, I've got at least 15 encounters with police officers who have pulled me over and for literally nothing. I was out too late one night. I got pulled over for riding a bike in Daytona Beach. And in, in none of these instances, I don't think in most of these instances, I even got a ticket. Like, I know when I've done wrong. I know when I'm driving 100 miles an hour and the police officers pull me over. I still think they're pigs when I'm wrong. But but all the other games, they are. <laughs> I was going to try to say that with a straight face. But on the so I have so many more uh, uh, instances of where I did literally nothing wrong. And I didn't I didn't get a ticket. And the reason I didn't get, get a ticket is because I just played alone. All the stuff I talk on this show, all of this, all of this. I know that when it comes and when I was 11 o'clock at night and I'm by myself on my way home and a police officer pulls me over. The only thing that's on my mind is not injustice, not in not not fighting against police corruption and, and, and systemic uh, 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 violence. None of that is on my mind. The only thing that's on my mind is I got to get away from this pig and get home to my kids. And so. Where Bernie Sanders answer was insufficient is that he did not recognize that that sacrifice is something that causes significant grief and long term pain in black people. And that you can only take down so much. That's why I don't cover that's, that's why I don't cover uh, 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 police brutality. I just don't because I don't think people understand how much that that stuff actually hurts us. Not just to it, it hurts to see people killed and dehumanized and brutalized over and over again. But it also doubly it's compounded doubly because many of us have experienced this over and over and over and over again. And eventually one of us will snap. And when we do, we don't get the luxury of Susan and Karen who can sit in their car and yell at a police officer. And that police officer understands the, the way the social construct is in this country is that if Karen, who has raisins in her potato salad, is yelling at him, he can't he can't he can't brutalize her. He can't drag her out the car. He can't mollywop her with her, his baton. He can't kill her without the entire system asking what the hell did you do wrong Mr. Officer but if it's a Negro if it's a nigga he can have his way and write up any report that he wants see see that's that right there had is you, I, mm, that's the difference so it's not that Bernie Sanders was wrong said it was woefully insufficient and it puts our this dehumanizing experience up front every single time and yes i'm going to teach my kids how to set aside their humanity and their dignity for about five minutes just so that they can get home and get away from this pig who sees that this is their opportunity. This is the big moment that they've been training for. I got a live one. I got a nigga. And here we go. If this, if he just so much as, as breathes too hard, I'm going to put him in his place. You think I'm playing? Look at all the examples we got. Look at all the examples we have. It's proper English. Look at all the times, all the times where, where we have videos of white women and sometimes white men who can challenge the system right there on the spot without fear of their lives. And we black people <laughs> challenge the system. Nigga, we might get killed challenging the system in a large group protesting. You saw what they did to us during civil rights. You see what they did to us. I mean, I don't even got to go back that far. You see what they did to us in Ferguson. They brought out the military tanks and the Humvees and the SWAT team and the snipers. So if they're willing to to assault us in mass groups, you better damn well believe that they will kill us in a minute and write up their own version of accounts because a, a dead man can't defend himself. <sighs> 
I, this is why I don't cover this stuff. I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, there, there's a level of your soul that dies when you do this, when you do this work and you cover this stuff all over and over and over again. I can't, I don't even share the videos unless it's just so big that I have to share the videos because underneath it is our, our real experiences of black people who have had to not only endure injustices in the moment, but they've had to sacrifice their dignity and their humanity and they had to set aside their desire for justice in order to simply make it home. So that's what Bernie Sanders got wrong. But he's right. Because I, until we change this system, I'm going to tell my kids the same thing I tell myself every time this happens. Get away from this pig. Because he's a small person with a big gun who's looking for the opportunity to just show that he's important. He's looking for the chance to assert his manhood, probably because he had an insufficient childhood. He was he was inadequate. He was a he was a loser in high school. And he just now now he's the big guy on the block because he's got a gun. So when you're dealing with small people with big guns and you're black, I tell my kids the same thing Bernie Sanders said. Get home. Get away from the pig. And get home. But in the meantime, as a candidate for the president of the United States, I need him to understand that underlying pain. And that he doesn't understand that pain. It's just something, you know, I don't I mean, Kamala Harris's answer was way worse. So like, get a job, you know, get job, stop bullets. Mm, I almost call that woman something. I just want I just want my guy to understand that. That's all. That's not asking too much. All right, let's move on. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and support the Benjamin Dixon show. I'm not quite done talking about that topic, but before I continue, I want to thank our patrons without whom this is not possible. You all rock 100 percent. Special shout out to our newest patrons, Alex P. Thank you, Alex, for becoming a patron. Special shout out to my brother, Robin D., for increasing his pledge from $10 a month to $27 a month. That rocks. I, I said D. <laughs> I said Robin D. Like, and I said he's my brother. Like, like you don't realize his last name is Dixon. So anyway, thank you, Robin. Um, also, special thanks to Little Flower. Thank you for becoming a patron. And Kristen S., thank you for becoming a patron. And last but not least, thank you to David B. For increasing his pledge. All that means a lot. It really means a lot because you're you're telling me that that you recognize the importance and the value of my work so much so that you're willing to put money um, to support it. So thank you. All right. One last thing about the Bernie Sanders thing. There's the political side of it. Right. The first entire portion was just just really me dealing with. I mean, I really physically feel it. I'm really glad uh, that I'm on this. Um, this is a huge tangent. So ride with me. <laughs> I'm going on a long tangent. I am extremely grateful that I'm on this weight loss thing that my brother put me on and he's lost 200 pounds. I've lost 50 pounds. I'm grateful for it because it's helping me handle the physical reactions that I have to this type of thing. Like some some hurt really gets so deep that you physically feel it. And I actually physically feel it right now this morning. And I'm just grateful that I'm not feeling it with those extra 50 pounds. It would have been compounded so much worse. It's like you can handle stress a lot more when you get this, this start getting this weight off you. But putting the emotional trauma aside, the politics of it, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm better at talking about the politics of it. So there will always be a group of people who dislike anyone but particularly Bernie Sanders in this case and they will always take everything as an opportunity to attack him and where at the beginning of this I showed you where what he said was insufficient even though it was accurate uh, it was insufficient because it completely ignores or misses the pain uh, of having to be dehumanized and, and brutalized twice one by the injustice that is occurring but also by the fact that you have to take down just to survive Especially when we're living in a society where Karen and Susan, they don't have to do that. They can assert they can they can actively assert their disappointment and their disagreement. They can voice their dissent right there in the moment. So so while he missed that, there will always be people who will weaponize these type of things against Bernie Sanders. Um, I don't really care about them doing that. 
because until he's the nominee, they're going to fight like hell to stop him. So they would take every opportunity to weaken him. Now, again, I don't want you to interpret what I'm saying as excusing Sanders. Is it asking too much for him to understand that pain? Well, there's a guy and I can't find his tweet because I can't remember his name, but he's on MSNBC all the time with the wild hair. It's a kind of big guy. And uh, look at me. I don't lost 50 pounds and I'm calling other people big guys. <laughs> but anyway, I think it's like Elise or something, Elise NYC, but I couldn't find it. I tried my best to find the tweet, but he, he I kind of like what he said about it on Twitter. He basically said that, you know, the excuse that he's going to give Sanders, he's going to give him an out. And it's the fact that he's an old white guy. It's not it's not just playing in identity politics when he said this. Right. He's an old white guy. So the perspective from which he's going to view the world is going to clearly be different. But also the problem with it is that he's an old white guy. So the perspective of the world that he's going to view is different. And, 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 And when it's so different, you have to be able to empathize on that level. On, on, on the level that I'm communicating this morning, right? I need Bernie Sanders to understand that pain so that when he talks to America about that pain, you know, it, it when he talks to America about that pain, he can connect with us and he can speak to our, because the president of the United States, more than anything else, notwithstanding this moron that we have in the White House right now, is is an emotional leader for the United States of America. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand that they're blowing shit up in other countries. Right. So, you know, we can have that conversation. But all, but communicating to the domestic, to the to, to the body politic here, like we need people who can understand our pain. So all the way back to Elisa's tweet, he was like, you know, the excuse is that Bernie Sanders just comes from a different world. He's an old white guy and he just doesn't understand. But that's also the problem. Now, I think that's a fair assessment. I think that's a pretty fair assessment, but you're going to have other people who all day long are going to just milk this for what they can get out of it. This does not excuse Sanders. Are we asking more of Sanders than we're asking of any other candidate? I don't really know or care because I'm not I'm Benjamin Dixon, not supporting any other candidate. I'm supporting Bernie Sanders. And so I want the other candidates to mess up so I can I can milk it just like they're trying to milk this with Bernie Sanders. So so if, if your problem is, well, Ben, nobody asked anybody else these types of questions. Well, they did ask Kamala Harris and she really fumbled the ball way worse than Sanders ever could. But what I'm saying, what I'm saying is I don't personally care that other candidates aren't asked this question and they get it wrong or they are never asked. So it doesn't come up. I don't care because I don't care for them as candidates. I expect more of people that I support. So there's two things happen simultaneously. There's a political manipulation of this. And this is why I always say, like, you know, identity politics matter. But that doesn't mean that identity politics won't be weaponized. And we see we see them weaponizing this against Bernie Sanders because they're doing everything they can to stop him from becoming the nominee. But simultaneously, I need him to understand. I need him to understand. Okay, I got a lot more to cover, man. Let's, um, you're in for a long show today. All right. Pretty what it is. Pretty what it is. Pretty what it is. Pretty what it is. Bin Laden was a big thing, but this is the biggest there is. This is uh, the worst ever. Uh, Osama bin Laden was very big, but Osama bin Laden became big with the World Trade Center. This is a man who built a whole. Uh, as he would like to call it, a country, a caliphate, uh, and was trying to do it again. That is your president, President Donald Trump. Um, Basically saying that Osama bin Laden wasn't a big deal uh, because over the weekend, America uh, killed Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and uh, the the leader of ISIS. And, uh, well, a, a couple of things here this is uh you just wonder how far this guy can go how how self-absorbed he can get to tr- to make a moment it, and and how dis- self-destructive he is like this honestly could have been a really decent national security score for him just talk about the politics first the the the, the national security implications of this is actually important and 
I don't care. I really don't care about anyone's politics. Like ISIS is a scourge, a cancer that needs to be, I mean, wiped out like with the with the strongest regimen of chemotherapy to just burn them out of existence. And I only hesitate here because, you know, the this was actually a win. And Donald Trump being the narcissistic megalomaniac that he is. Turned his own win into a staggeringly embarrassing failure. Now, number one, most people in America they know what ISIS is, but they have no idea who Abu al-Baghdadi, I can't even say his name right that fast, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, they had no idea who he was. And, and the, the fact, I guess we should not be surprised that Donald Trump doesn't have enough um, wherewithal to understand that or enough wherewithal to allow a moment to speak for you without you speaking for you like it's a type of people who go around bragging about their accomplishments and they brag and 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 the bragging itself diminishes their accomplishment anyway what's the point of even trying to understand this moron but how the other side of it is how little of a man do you have to be to constantly be chasing the specter of barack obama there's so many ways he could do this. If if you if you're jealous of somebody, you never let the world know that you're jealous. Like I've suffered from jealousy before, <laughs> and I would never do anything to reveal the fact that I'm jealous of a person. Because the only thing that's worse than feeling the jealousy that you feel is having other people know that you're that jealous. I. I <laughs> So anyway, here the real conversation is this is a this is a, a significant win because ISIS needs to be wiped off the face of the earth, not only because of how many people they're killing, not only what they're doing, the bastardization of Islam and their number one targets being Muslims, like Muslims being killed in in, in like by the thousands. Um, not only that, but just their sheer disregard for anything like one of the, one of the things that, that got me, I mean. The, the the beheadings, the the the, the brutalizing, the, the murders, the mass murders, but then they're also also the complete disregard for history and it, like some of the most treasured ancient relics and sites in in, a, in in the world have been destroyed by these bastards. So it was a an actual win that he could stand on. But because of his jealousy of Barack Obama, he he just kind of minimized it and turned it into something that is just another footnote in the embarrassment that is the president of the United States. Kind of weird. But here's where it's not weird. I know people like him. I've seen I've I've dealt with people like him who above anything else, it is important that they make a situation about them. And as a result, stuff just constantly backfires over and over and over again. And basically, too long didn't read like my boy Bernie Sanders said about Trump at his rally. All right, all right, he's an idiot. That's the sound of thousands of fans at last night's World Series game uh, between the Washington Nationals and the Houston Astros cheering, chanting, lock him up. Speaking of Donald Trump, as he entered the stadium last night, expecting a big thunderous applause, and he realized those weren't cheers. Those were boos and chants for his impeachment. It was a beautiful sight. You had people who dropped banners, huge banners that said impeach Trump. You could read it across the field. Um, you had veterans for Trump who posted up right behind the uh, um, the umpire so that it, it, it didn't give a moment during the World Series. You saw that veterans wanted Trump impeached. 
Um, and this, all of this happening on the same day that he announced that that Donald Trump announced that America had killed Abu Bakr al Baghdadi. So it's like he couldn't get love, not even on his biggest day. Um, everybody wasn't happy about this. Some people thought that the that the uh, this was not the American uh, no, thing I, to do. Again, I speak to the lock him up chance. Yeah. Uh, again, I, it, it's just it's un-American. Uh, it started with Donald Trump. Uh, in fact, he's made it a centerpiece of his campaign rallies. I mean, and we I, and, find and, it sickening when it happens let, at his let, rallies. Let, let, let I find it. it kind of sickening well, to of watch it's people sickening. It's, leering at we, the president. We are Americans, and and we do not do that. Do <laughs> not uh, Joe, morning Joe and Mika. Seriously, like, no, America, what we do is protest, like, you know, granted, America is really big enough to absorb all of our protests and doesn't really care about any of our protests. But that's setting aside that grim reality. This is America. And we do it the damn well. We do what we damn well, please. This is the least. I mean, how this is poetic, how it is a beautiful, poetic sentiment and moment. That the chant that he started is now legitimately being used against him because he is a criminal. He has, he has, I mean, he has plundered. He has pillaged and plundered the American taxpayer to the tune of upwards of a hundred million dollars that he has funneled into his private businesses through making sure that no matter where or when they go somewhere, America is spending money at his resorts. That's just the, like that's just textbook, right? Not to mention all of the other things that legitimately have made the case for him to be locked up. You have to take a step back and just see the beauty and the irony of the moment. But you will always have um, finger wagging, concern trolling centrists who aren't really about that life. They this is America. We don't do these types of things. <laughs> No, this is America and this is exactly what we do. And in this case, we are going to lock this man up. He can't escape justice forever just because he's temporarily immune as the president of the United States. I mean, obstruction of justice is something that many people have spent many years in prison for. And what I, I think it could it really should almost be a litmus test. And I think this is what people are afraid of. People are genuinely afraid of America holding America accountable. Right. Of course, we are. We should be hesitant about the specter of prosecuting your political rivals. Right. Just the specter of that is problematic. And I get that in context. But at a certain point, we have to be able to hold the most powerful people in this country accountable. And as, because of that, I feel like we should really be asking our presidential candidates who is going to hold the outgoing administration accountable, not just Donald Trump, but from top to bottom. And if they can't do it, then we're going to need some local officials to look into these crimes and hold these people accountable, all while being mindful of the specter of prosecuting your political rivals. Just that is something to consider. But these aren't these aren't elected officials. These are these people cheering. They weren't they weren't like Democrats cheering it. Like like Donald Trump had Republicans cheering it. These are these are American citizens who have seen what this president has done over the last three years. And they have concluded that the most appropriate response to him is this. Listen, I need someone to make this happen. I need I need some of you to contact Kirk Franklin and the rest of you to contact Bernie Sanders because there's a theme song for his 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 campaign that should have always been the theme song for his campaign. Listen real quick. Yeah, so that's all that's all I'm going to play of it just because I wanted you to, you know, I don't want to get it hit with a copyright infringement, but I mean, come on. There's no greater song for Bernie Sanders' campaign, you know, and I'm pretty sure Kirk would be down for it. So come on, Twitter, let's get on it. Let's make that happen. Kirk, I'll let your boy. 
All right, this is good. This is as good a place as any for me to segue into what I wanted to talk about the entire episode. But we had to get the politics out of the way. Kanye West. Kanye West is we have to talk about it because there are so many things happening with this uh, with what Kanye is doing is operating on so many levels that I might actually need to write this down. I don't know if I can have an open stream of consciousness on this one, but I'm going to try. Kanye West is doing what powerful people have done throughout world history. They are using the emotionality of people who believe in God to their own personal profitable ends. That's one. The other thing that he's doing is he's openly embracing a white supremacist interpretation of Christianity while simultaneously telling us that he's being free and he wants to help free us. That's number two. And number three, we have a whole lot of black preachers, particularly men who seem to not understand what the hell is going on and that he is doing this to them in their pulpits. That's number three. Now, Setting aside the argument of the existence of God, because I know I speak to a lot of atheists on a regular basis and we're all cool. You know, I love you. You love me. You know, I love God. I know you don't believe in God, but but let's set that aside for a second, because even beyond the argument for the existence of God, we can all see how religion has been used in society. And we can all see the many times religion has been used as an abusive tool for powerful people to maintain power for them to accumulate wealth in the here and now while telling you to wait for your blessings in the hereafter. Right. We've seen, we've seen how wars have been justified in the name of God. And they're nothing more than than the exploits of ambitious men trying to expand their empire. And we see that now presently with the United States of America, you know, couching every war that we get engaged in, in the name of God. 2003 we went to Iraq and it was it was a it might as well have been a crusade in terms of the terminology and the manipulation of the masses using religion so whether or not you believe in God that that is irrelevant at this juncture because we have to address how religion is being used in society and Kanye West is giving us a master class on how you use religion for your own personal ends and it goes deeper than that as I stated at the top of this So here's what he's doing. He understands that he has the ability to reposition himself to prosper. Yes, I'm using T.D. Jakes's line. He's repositioning himself to reinvent himself temporarily so that he can make money off of this gospel album. Because he understands that at the core of most black people in particular, this is where it intersects black people. Like there is a sensitive soft spot in the heart of every black person, really every person who loves God. But particularly the role that God has played in sustaining our minds and keeping us from snapping on society and keeping us from, you know, it, there's, there's an emotional connection that we all have. And so when we see somebody say, or even just the slightest hint that they believe in God, like we do, it connects across generations. It's like, it's like a, a language that is spoken that connects beyond everything. Like, It's so powerful. It's such a powerful emotional connection that if Donald Trump came to a black church, I think he could probably get away without being booed and chased out of the temple if he just got up there and did what Hillary Clinton did at Elijah Cummings funeral just last week. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That's how powerful just that phrase right there, you know. Just being able to communicate with religious people in a language that that connects us across the generations. I mean, God forbid, uh, God forbid Donald Trump goes into a church and says something like, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, (laughs) man, black folks, you know, we'd have a we'd have a a decision point that we would have to make. And, And the problem is, is that historically we've decided on the side of I love 
and I appreciate and I embrace people who speak in my language, my la- my faith language. We hear certain things and it immediately conjures an emotional connection with that person. And the problem is, is that when you know the power of that emotionality, you can manipulate that emotionality. And this is what Kanye West is doing. Kanye West and, and to a particular brand of Christianity, the, the, the worst. See, you can use your powers for evil or you can use your powers for good. You can stand and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, let's do something good for humanity or you can do it for profit. And this is how we've seen religion play out historically time and time and again. And Kanye West is giving us a master class in it. Why? Because he is playing a game. He is playing a game for record sales, but he's also playing a game for his own personal gratification and his own ego. Because the type of religion, the type of Christianity that, that, that this guy, this cat is embracing is the, is, the, is the Christianity of white supremacy. Don't believe me? As Bruno Mars and my pastor always say, just watch. Your faith, <laughs> what really tells us what type of religion you have is how your religion interacts with society. Period. Because we can all we can all talk about the hereafter. Every every religion wants you to focus. Every every religion has a group of people to be more specific that want you to focus solely on the here and after hereafter, not the here and now. Don't worry about society. Don't worry about how capitalism is ravaging our communities. Don't worry about police brutality. Don't talk about that stuff. Don't talk about racism. Don't talk about any of these things that are practical and affect our day to day lives. Focus on the hereafter. Focus on when we all get to heaven. Focus on the sweet by and by. Focus on sending up your timbers. Focusing on on uh, the upper room. All of the other cliches that we have to represent after we're dead. They have masterfully given us the, the ultimate escapism in order to not say a thing about what's happening right now. And focus solely on when we die. So if we just peradventure just take Take for consideration for one second that God doesn't exist. Look what these bastards have done. They have gotten you to completely ignore the practical ramifications of what society is, what's happening in society, the systems that are causing these things to happen. And they completely given you an escape route to not worry about anything that's happening in front of you. You just worry about when we all get to heaven while they are using this religion as a tool for economic accumulation in the here and now. So the real question to me, if you want to understand what type of religion you're really serving, is what does your faith do in the here and now? Because we all got the hereafter solved, right? We in, in our own way, in our own interpretation, we all figured out what happens after we die. Fine. Okay. You're going to heaven. Congratulations. Now, what is your faith doing in the here and now? Well, let's ask Kanye West. The very specific type of religion that Kanye West has openly embraced is a religion of white supremacy because he is asking you. No, he is downright telling you that the route to freedom for you is not to associate yourself with people who, for better or for worse, greater or lesser extent, and you can interpret it yourself how much Democrats are actually after liberation. Right. We can have that argument for days. We do have that argument for days. They're woefully inadequate in a lot of ways. But what Kanye West is telling you is that your route to freedom is through the slave master. He's telling you that your route to freedom is through Donald Trump. Your route to freedom is through the Republican Party. Your route to liberation is through a party that has done everything in its power to disenfranchise you to take away your ability to vote that has done everything in power to vilify you. Anytime you look at police brutality in our country, you're going to, you want nine times out of 10, you're going to find Republicans standing with the police officers, blaming and vilifying black people. Kanye West is telling you that that's your route to freedom. He's telling you that you are a slave because you don't associate with Republicans that you don't. I mean, how utterly fatuous and ridiculous it is that I have to go through this. 
But because he's rapping this latest venture of his in the veneer of spirituality, black folks who love Jesus and love it when people get on stage and and show us that for a moment that, oh, my gosh, they've changed. They've 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 accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Well, that's not my black voice. (laughs) But because he's wrapped it in the veneer of spirituality, we miss what he's doing in the here and now. And we ignore the fact that he's making a profit out of it, off of it. In the here and now, he's telling you that the route to your liberation, children of Israel, is through Pharaoh. He's telling you that the route to to you being freed from slavery is through people who literally celebrate the Confederacy, who still hold white supremacists in the in their hearts. He's telling you that the route to your liberation is through people who would just as soon vilify you and side with police officers if you got shot by police. Kanye West is telling you that your route to freedom, the the way that you get off the plantation. He's like Harriet Tubman telling you that the way off the plantation is to run into the arms of the slave master. And this is this is not figurative. These are when they figuratively say they Kanye West. And Republicans say that you're on the plantation of the Democratic Party. Do you ever pause to think that these are the same people who are trying to maintain the spirit and the legacy of the Confederacy in actual plantations? So they are figuratively irritating you by saying you're on the Democratic plantation while they are literally trying to protect monuments to white supremacy, including actual tangible plantations where white folks still go to get married because they think it's romantic like this this is the party that looks at your liberation and says Psh. and this is what Kanye West is selling you but because he wraps it in the veneer of the language of Christianity he wraps it in the veneer in the language of the love of God black folks eat that up Now, there's a level of accountability that has to take place, because if we know and we do know that religion has been used as a tool to manipulate us, to control us, to keep us literally in bondage. While telling us to be set free from the bondage of sin, the same slave masters were keeping us in literal physical bondage. If we know that religion has been used by wealthy people in order to accumulate wealth in the here and now while keeping you from ever questioning while you live in poverty all the way until the time that you're dead. If we know that, then how the hell do we allow this narcissistic megalomaniacal nigga Kanye West to come into our churches in the name of telling us that Jesus is king, but the message that he's delivering is one of oppression to white supremacist Christianity. Come. OK, I, talk with me, somebody. If you know better, pastor, then how is it that you allow this man just because you know what it is? Here's the next layer of it. Celebrity, fame, notoriety. The black church and white church for that matter, but I'm talking about the black folks here. We have not come to grips with the fact that we are still easily manipulated by fame and fortune and notoriety by the spoils of this system that we were always left out of. And we see people like Kanye West, who has a modicum of wealth and he represents a level of fame and and, and fortune that that so many black people aspire to. And so it's not only an issue of him connecting with our spirituality, it's an issue of him connecting with our own personal greed. (laughs) I'm preaching this morning. (laughs) You know, that's true. This is why this is why people like and I and I, I actually really like this dude here. He's in Atlanta now, Jamal Bryant. But that, you know, it doesn't make sense because Jamal Bryant knows he knows that there is two totally different interpreters of interpretations of Christianity and how they impact society is significantly different because white supremacist Christianity is what was used to keep us in bondage. But when Nat Turner got a hold of the Bible. And he saw that the Bible said that the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives and to set at liberty those who are oppressed. When he saw that, he said he would rather die liberating his people in the name of Jesus than to live as a slave in the name of a white supremacist Jesus. We know these things 
And yet we sit back because this is a black guy speaking the language of religiosity, playing on the emotionality of all the people who love Jesus. And he's doing it intentionally in the name of white supremacist Christianity, because that is a base that will support him as he saw all the way to the White House. But we 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 embrace him, we allow him in our pulpits. You can like his music if you want to like his music, but game recognized game. Don't this Donald Trump, yeah. Kanye West is using the name of Jesus to get to sell albums. But worse than that, because plenty of people who do that, he's using the name of Jesus to spread white supremacist Christianity. After all these years of the liberation gospel fighting against white supremacist Christianity, period, period, Pooh. Kanye West knows that he can sell a million records if he just talks to you about Jesus. Because he knows that we are all vulnerable, all of us who who connect with the emotionality of religion and 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 the commonality that we have with these phrases, with the with the way a certain scripture can strike up an emotion in us. Right. The way that a, a particular hymn can strike up an emotion in us that that is so powerful that it would make us ignore the transgressions of the person who's actually saying it to us. Right. Like like. It was so powerful that for a time we ignored that these are literal slave masters telling us about when we all get to heaven. And now we have we have one guy who's popular enough, famous enough to be able to gallivant across the country and jump into pulpits of all these ambitious preaching men. Who are more excited about being able to take a picture with Kanye West than they are about the fact and they are concerned about the fact that Kanye West is spreading a white supremacist Christianity because he is spreading a Christianity that is telling you that the way to your liberation is through Donald Trump. (laughs) He's telling you that the way to your freedom is through the Republican Party. He's saying that you're actually in bondage and that he's free, but he's defining freedom as being in bed with white supremacists. You can do what you want to do, believe what you want to believe, but I know enough about the Bible. And I know enough about religion in society to tell you this, that, that, that Kanye West is asking you to embrace the very Christians who would have lynched you on Saturday night and been in Sunday school on Sunday morning. That's what he's asking you to do all while you're buying his music, all while he's preaching in your pulpit, all while he's manipulating the emotionality of good of people who are genuine about your faith. <laughs> But for some reason, you have a blind spot. Oh, no, not some reason. But because your faith has created a blind spot that these pastors have not prepared you for. They aren't telling you. They aren't telling you this. They aren't telling you that some of our brothers right across the street at the evangelical church would just as soon see you not have the right to vote. Because they understand they understand the power of religion in society. And so while you're focusing on the hereafter. While you're focusing on the sweet by and by, while you're focusing on how much you love Jesus and when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. (laughs) I feel it even as right now, as I'm saying it, they know so long as they can keep you focused on the hereafter, then they can use religion as a tool to accumulate wealth and power in the here and now. And Kanye West is nothing more than the latest false prophet being sent to the black community by a white supremacist interpretation of Christianity. And that's all I've got to say about that. The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and support the Benjamin Dixon show. If you like this episode, be sure to share like and subscribe.